Monday morning after a long weekend at home. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. Uh, and we're talking about energy this morning, Hawaii, the state of clean energy. We're talking about Eurus, Eurus Energy with its project in Waianae, uh, pulls back from the Palihua Wind Project. Uh, very interesting and, uh, and really troublesome, actually, also. Uh, it cited too many risk factors for wind developers uh, in Hawaii, so it pulled back. And to discuss this uh, is a representative of the, I guess, the landowner, that is a Gill um, Eva Lands organization, Tony Gill. Hi, Tony. Morning. Morning. So, you know, uh, let me open it up by saying, what happened here? What happened in the pullback? Well, I can give you a pretty good summary. Uh, there probably, with any big corporate decision, there was uh, a decision made by a board. Now, I was not in the room. The room was in Tokyo. I understand roughly the considerations that have been made, and it's a real good business school test case. There are a couple of factors. Uh, do you want me to go down the list, or should I just start with sure. one and elaborate? Start with one and uh, then go to the other. And probably the key thing here is that, as you know, time and money are linked the same way as space and time are linked in some physical process. If you're going to play with money, you're also playing with time because you make commitments and you borrow money, you do construction, you do other things. And at a certain point, you have to have revenue coming in to offset that or you're in big trouble. This is a, a situation of probably, uh, I don't know, well, I won't speak specifically, but well north of 100 million bucks to get the thing started and running. If you can't guarantee that a thing will come through on time, you can't do the deal. So you look in the process and you, you figure out why would a company back off? You look at all the kinds of ways time gets wasted. I can go into this in a lot of detail. There's a lot of blame to go around. Uh, secondly is the problem that if you go through the long and uh, arduous process of getting something up, ready, and permit in hand, it looks to much of the rest of the world like Hawaii is a pretend state with pretend law that cannot be enforced. So what good is your permit? Mm. Uh, there are other kinds of internal frictions. There's a general problem that to do things in Hawaii is about 400% more expensive for this kind of project than any place else. And there are a lot of other opportunities to put money. Um, the difficulty of developing wind continues to rise is partially offset by increases in uh, uh, sorry I'm just getting rid of other tech here uh, increases in effectiveness of uh, say bat mitigation so there's a series of factors that are involved and they're, they're kind of macro factors some of them deal with local situations some are just global um, you know tell me what you want me to talk about this, well, it's a confluence isn't it factors. It's a yeah. confluence. It's a confluence of factors we've been talking about, you know, for a long time. We've all been talking about it for a long time, and and you're at the cutting edge because you're at the cutting edge of this project. But let's let's back up for a minute. Um, you know, the fact is that uh, a wind project at this particular mountain range there above Kahi Point, above the uh, generation station at Kahi Point, yeah. it's it's, yeah. it's the best wind in Oahu, as I understand it. And it's the best location in Oahu because all you have to do is, is run a cable down the hill to the generation station. Now you're connected with, you know, with, with the whole island. So, uh, you know, we, we, we yeah. haven't been able to, I'd like to talk about this, we haven't been able to transmit energy from the neighbor islands. I mean, for example, the cable from uh, Lanai years ago, that was a dull thud. Uh, a lot of activism there and hard to understand, a lot of misunderstanding, misinformation. But that, the end of it was uh, over and it becomes radioactive. You know, that is also uh, I'm going to be on the final exam. Radioactive in Hawaii. Some things get radioactive and they're dead, make dead. Um, you know, yeah. such as the super ferry. We talk about that in the same context. But, you know, this, this project started, gee whiz, in the early 2000s under uh, an owner different than Eurus Energy. Um, Correct. And uh, the utility tried to get it through, tried to get it through the... Uh, you know, the, the local residents who opposed it. Mufi Hanneman said they would, they, the city would never give a permit to the project. And it, it lied dormant, it lay dormant for a long time. Um, then there was the predecessor to Eurus, and then there was Eurus fellow named Nick Hendrickson in San Diego. Um, and he tried so hard and put so much money in and raised so much capital 
that, you know, I think I was, we had him on the show a couple of times. I was encouraged. I was even optimistic. Uh, uh, maybe I should not have been that this project would actually get done. And, and, and part of that, Tony, is, you know, your organization. So local family thing. Um, so it's not like, uh, you know, somebody else owns the land, somebody far away. Um, it's you guys, you know, our neighbors and friends. And, um, and then to find that the guy was running into trouble, really, really sad. So you have this confluence of things. One is a long time to get a permit. Two, uh, as you mentioned before, um, you get the permit, you're not sure it's a real permit or a make-believe permit. It's a pretend permit. Look at TMT. That, that, that was a pretend permit. <laughs> didn't really work. Um, okay. And I, can, so, uh, I can tell you're excited, Jay. I can tell you're excited. Look. Well, I guess I'm excited because I see this kind of project as progressive, as necessary, yeah. as saving us all money without any negative aspect to it whatsoever. And the project that yours set up was not going to bother anybody. And yet we in our special culture stopped it. We did. Well, we did. Now you've covered a tremendous amount of area. The case for this site is that it is superior wind and it's adjacent to the trunk line that feeds half the island. It's the easiest possible interconnect. You don't need to run power from Kahuku all the way back. You plug right in to the backbone of the island. And uh, we've arranged this plan. We attempted to make it invisible from most of Nanakuli because you can't see through rock. This doesn't seem to penetrate the public consciousness yet. But these, these are the problems. If you're going to develop a, pr a project in Hawaii, it's like running a gauntlet where people dump boiling oil on you. They insult you. They defy your ancestry. They, you know, try to run you off the road in 150 ways. And if you get to the end of the project, you're not sure you have a permit that can go. That's just how we do. We like to do things that way in Hawaii. We, we love this kind of process. So it, it's always difficult to do anything new, especially anything big and especially anything essential. But what people haven't got through their head yet, and this is the coronavirus teaching moment, is if you think coronavirus is an issue for the economy, you had better think ahead about the much larger bulldozer that's coming in the world of energy and the world of global warming. I've personally been upset about that since 1972. I don't understand why people are not as activated about the problems of energy supply, carbon dioxide and overheating as they are about coronavirus, which will go away in a couple of months. And then we will have the same future coming. But here, this is the big problem. Let's start from the top and work down. The whole state is going to go conveniently to renewables very easily, except for Oahu, where most of the people are and most of the industry is. Kauai, easy case. Maui, they're on it. Big Island can be done. Oahu, probably never. And I say probably never because if you can't build wind, what you'll find out is that you need hundreds and hundreds of acres of solar to get anywhere close to what wind can produce on a tiny spot. And when you multiply out the amount of energy that's going to be required with commercial solar, you've got nowhere near the solution. So naturally, the people who don't like wind at all are already against offshore wind, which if you have no offshore wind, no onshore wind, no commercial scale solar, a rooftop isn't going to do it. Where are you at? Nuclear? I mean, the, uh -oh. the problem, well, that's a the problem that is one. it's a small island with an incredible energy draw. So here's a solution. Two-thirds of everybody move out. That would work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, o Oahu is going to be an extremely hard case. And the only way people will get this ultimately is when the power starts to flicker or else we continue to be a horrid polluter and uh, degrade the planet. Now, you know, I, I don't think we need to be in that world, but that's kind of the world we're drifting into if there can't be correct policy solutions that enable things to fit in. Everybody's going to have to pull their elbows in. No, no Hard question. question. What exactly, what exactly um, do the opponents of this project um, 
you know, argue. Now, in the North Shore, they argue NIMBY, I mean, among other things. And there are a couple of uh, wind projects there that people are opposing. Um, this one is different. This one is like hidden. Uh, you wouldn't see it. It's not in every, anybody's backyard. It's not despoiling the environment in any way. Uh, it is not even a visual uh, obstruction. Um, so what, what exactly is the objection that people have raised to this project? Well, you're going to have to ask them. Now, a lot of people feel they can see it when they wouldn't be able to. A lot of people feel that they will be affected by some mysterious process. They're probably too distant to experience. Some people claim that they know it's there and they don't want it. But I think the prim primary argument against doing something like Polyhua Wind is, oh my gosh, we don't need to do this. It will only despoil the countryside. Why don't we just do it all with rooftop solar? Okay, that's the closest thing to a coherent counter argument that I've heard. And the answer to that is because everybody in the industry and HECO and everybody who's read the PSIP know that you can't do it with rooftop solar. That's the short well, answer. Well, also rooftop solar is, uh, you know, capitalizes on disparity of income. Um, Indeed. You know, so it's for rich if people. I have uh, 40,000 bucks lying around, I can do rooftop solar. And a lot, a lot of people have that as a matter of fact. If I don't have that lying around, then I can't do it. And it's benefiting yeah, yeah. mostly me. So if, well, for the yeah. average Joe, it's really, really unfair to rely on rooftop solar. I'm sorry. It should be community solar. It should be, you know, large solar facilities operated uh, under the utility. Um, it should not it should not rely on rooftop solar. We've already we've, we picked that fruit and now we have to find way to be equitable. Uh, the, the, the 2016 PSIP, which you can find online, is Power Supply Improvement Plan. HECO's got it. You can read it. Uh, I think a person with um, high school math and physics should be able to understand it. Uh, if this is the problem, rooftop solar maxed out is going to get us about here. Commercial solar, large scale, is going to push up and push up until it runs into resistance because of the amount of area that it takes. It leaves you with a significant shortfall that has to be supplied by something else. So what I've been telling people is we can do on three quarters of an acre of footprint on the ground what would take 500 acres of solar. This is because wind is immensely more productive than solar on a footprint basis. So we're able to use the land for agricultural purposes or forestry or some other function, whereas you can't use that land for anything else other than solar while it's there. So well, on an island which is very compressed, somebody's got to do the thinking. Uh, and actually, I, I think this is a major impediment and one that the legislature could solve pretty quickly. Nobody's really seriously sat down and tried to parse out, well, exactly what land would have to go to what purpose to get the job done. There's a bill in the legislature to study this, which is like uh, 10 years behind the curve. Normally, you do the plan before you announce the goal, but, you know, we do it the other way around, and that's fine. Isn't that uh, easy, but, Tony? Isn't that easy? You put some knowledgeable people in, in the room, and you give them a couple of days, they come up with a plan. This is not complicated, is it? Well, yes and no. It's not complicated to do a concept plan, but what people don't understand is that this is it's solving the energy problem depends on hundreds of volunteers. All right. There's no governmental authority that declares there shall be a wind farm here and a solar farm here. You can plan for it, but somebody has to decide, I want to take that jump. And that would be me, you know, and other dummies like me who try to volunteer to do something in the public interest. Um, but, well, but this, it's, it's got to be everybody. Every, every it. single case, every single case depends on somebody stepping up to say, I'm willing to use some land like this to get the job done. And that is an economic analysis and a social analysis and a political analysis in each individual case. It doesn't happen in any centrally driven way. HECO cannot drive it. HECO depends on volunteers to step up to solve the energy problem. The state government depends on volunteers to step up. So the, the, the public policy question is, are you going to create a process that 
is even workable for somebody to step up and solve the problem. Well, um, that's why this is this is so profound that a company like this putting all that money in already, you know, organizing it right down to the nines, um, backs backs off and it's making a huge statement about Hawaii, not dissimilar from the TMT program, uh, no, in which not, I, it's not the Japanese part of the consortium is that it's not going to fund it anymore. And so, okay, well, the activists seem to have won that, at least in part. And so where are we there? It's the it's same not thing. Really so, it, I, I don't. I think that you give activism too big a, a credit in this picture because it is complex. Certainly that's a component. Nobody wants to be the bad guy and cause demonstrations and disrupt everybody's auntie. And nobody wants to be that guy. But on top of that kind of problem, the to, to get anything done, as I said in the beginning, requires some kind of a foreseeable time schedule. If you're dealing with money, you're also dealing with time. If I mean, developers now have to plan in advance for litigation, they budget in X years of litigation costs, how many trips to the Supreme Court, uh, you know, and, and so forth. And, and the problem with this process is you can't get a thing done on schedule because the purpose of most most complaints, some are very valid and founded in legal process, some are purely for delay. Tony, some isn't that intentional? Isn't Pardon? that intentional? It's intentional. Of course. In other words, I don't want this project to happen, whether it's NIMBY or some philosophical, cultural, historical reason. I don't want it to happen. So what? what's my best leverage to stop it? Well, I delay oh, you, it. I delay it until delay. no developer can afford to delay. And that's what I'm sure that's what happened here. That's what that's what happened elsewhere. You can you know, you can litigate somebody right out of business. Look at DMT. Look at the super ferry. Look at the yeah, super no, nobody, ferry. Nobody, nobody would disagree with that process. I think that, and I, I have a foot on both sides of this argument. Uh, I come from a long environmental background and I can tell you that delay is the best weapon because many times yeah. the law does not address the real issues. If you want the real issues addressed, you've got to change the law in some manner, but in the absence of having the real issues addressed in the law, then delay is your best tool. Of course, I mean, as, as a guy who's litigated my share, I completely agree with that. But the problem is that we don't have an infinite amount of time left on the earth. And so to get to where we need to get in relatively short order is a challenge. And it means everybody's going to have to find a way to accommodate what they don't really want. Um, you know, there's a the well, everybody's going to understand what the stakes are. You know, if, if I gave you a state with uh, 1.3 million people, all of whom understood about clean energy, all of whom understood about climate change, all of whom were, you know, willing to, what did you say, volunteer and cooperate in initiatives, progressive initiatives to get there, to get to our goals, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Pele Hu would be no. going forward, you know, in great guns. But people do well, not population does not understand what the ultimate target is and what their role is in, in, in helping it. Huh? Yeah. yeah, I think that that's broadly true. I think that large numbers of people understand generally that we have a serious global problem and that Hawaii has to do its share and that we need all to pull together in some way around some common plan to get there. But what there is not present in the society is, is a clear vision of what that would constitute. And I think we have a, a real difficulty here locally because that discussion is not mature. So what we have to do is we have to start creating a fairly vivid image of what the target is. Now, I'm going to tell you, I think I alluded to this before, in the state we have an incredible reverence and nostalgia for our past. It is sentimental it's it moves thousands of people to do things you know that some notion of a lost or imagined past drives a, an incredible amount of political behavior here this is not a forward thinking culture by and large compared to many places you can go to all places around the world and you'll find people who are earnestly trying to get rid of their past and solve the incoming problem 
We're busy trying to think about how to survive in 1550, not 2050. So we have a, we have a serious impediment here. Uh, it, we do not have a clear image of what it's going to take to get past the problems of the next 50 to 100 years. We don't even have an image of exactly what's going to look like in August after coronavirus, but <laughs> that is going to have a severe impact. It'll be a teachable moment. What we have to assemble is what does it look like? And here's the principle that I, I, want, I want to kind of put out to you. Properly viewed, everything valuable interrupts everything else that's valuable. We are in a paradoxical world, particularly on Oahu. Do you want food sustainability? Then you cannot have in the same area solar panels. You cannot have in the same area outdoor recreation. You cannot have unimpeded forest land to gaze on. All right, well, what do you want? Do you want energy? All right, well, if you want energy, that impedes other things. If you want agriculture, that impedes other things. So, so I say with tongue in cheek, everything worth doing interrupts everything else worth doing. And we're in that kind of a problem because we've got so many people in such a small space with so few resources. But we're it's just priorities. To create a new solution. Yeah. As you said, it's a matter of establishing priorities. And, and I'll go a step further. As you, as you implied, it's a matter of leadership. So if I have a strong leader, let's let's make you and me, uh, you know, a, a, a dual duality. We're going to lead this thing. We get up one morning. We say, "Come on now, we need the oh, energy." Straight, straight away, I give up, and you're in charge, Jay. Okay, I'll let you be in charge. I'll just be your consigliere. <laughs> we need the uh, energy. We need to move ahead. We we can't get stuck like this. We've lost too many projects. Let's do this one. And um, you know, and I, you know, you you want to make a think about it. Go to court. Go to court and see if you win. And hopefully, you know, get that done early and not get all bogged down. And for, as for the government, you know, I've seen, two, you've probably seen this too. The government will consider an initiative. I was at a table in the, in the governor's office in the Lincoln time when this came up, <clears throat> where, where somebody said, but wait, they're going to, they're activists out there. They're going to oppose us, they're going to object. And, and, the, and the ruling group, you know, the group with the power said, oh, well, we can't do that. If there's going to be activists, we can't do that. So they're afraid, they're scared away of it, and they, they don't have any political will, and the project gets killed. I saw this happen. So, you know, my concern is, who's the leader? Who's saying, let's do it, boys. Follow me, boys. We're going to do this. We don't have that. Um, and, but finally, I wanted to go back. I want to go back to something you said, because it isn't as simple as this. I mean, if the picture you're painting, okay, is that is that Pelehua is really probably dead for whatever reasons. Those unless those reasons are fixed, yeah, just, just it's, dead, dead. it's dead for now. The wind didn't dead go for away. Now, you know. So those reasons go away. have to change. And and the same TMT is in deep kimchi. It's not likely to proceed. I'm telling you. And then you know we know that the uh, the cable from Lanai that's dead and radioactive. We know that the super ferry is dead and radioactive. You know, I, I talked to one guy who was on the inside of that, and I said, well, what'll it take? What'll it take to make TMT, or rather the super ferry happen again? And he said, well, it's, it's not gonna be Wall Street. It'll have to be government. I said, really, you gotta be kidding me. Government's not gonna build a ferry. Trust me, Tony, government's not gonna build a ferry. Not here. Maybe you stay to Washington, but not here. Anyway, so, you know, it seems to me these all these projects are dead and or dead and radioactive. They're not going to happen. So here we are. Then enter, enter uh, uh, coronavirus. Okay. You said before it's going to be two months. I beg to differ. It's going to well, be a year. It's, it's going to be a year. Out, I, I agree with you. We're probably looking at six months to a year of sequelae if we ever get back. I mean, if you look at the yeah, whole right, sequelae. Yet, so what, what happens then easy. is the economy of the state collapse. It's already collapsed. It's collapsed. You may be in your office, and I may be able to do this with you here on Think Tech, but the, the economy of the state is stopped cold. You know, it's got to have an effect on everybody and every project in every way. And so it's not only this project; it's every project is going to be stopped. The economy is really going to be, you know, diminished, tremendously diminished, and maybe some of it permanently, maybe a lot of it permanently, to say nothing I'm, of the national economy. 
I'm so really we, glad I got a chance to interview you today, Jay, because this has been pretty, pretty productive. Um, well, I haven't heard you disagree yet. Well, I, I, I don't so much. Um, but here's the, the political problem is this. We can satisfy one element of the uh, the society here by declaring grand goals. We're going to hit food sustainability. We're going to hit energy uh, self-sufficiency with renewables on, on the schedule. And we declare these grand goals. Uh, of course, there's, like I say, only volunteers can solve these problems. But on the other hand, having declared these grand goals and satisfied the one general con uh, co constituency, uh, it's still politically possible to walk back into a neighborhood and go, yeah, you know what? Don't fuss with these guys. Or, yeah, they're angry. Don't fuss with them and so forth. And, and so there hasn't been a political solution yet, which says this is our collective goal. We've all bought into it and we're going to bloody well do it. That has not happened yet. We're still able as uh, politicians to declare a grand goal on the one side and all kinds of impediments on the other to satisfy the individual constituencies. And until that paradox is resolved, the island can't move forward. And we need, yeah. we need, to, we need to create the, the general goal. Now, I've said before that there are all kinds of blame to go around if a project like this fails. But another way to look at it is it's an opportunity to see why it went wrong. And there, there are probably five or six reasons just on, under the delay category. It takes a long time for somebody like me to find an appropriate developer and the appropriate developer has to deal with Hawaiian Electric and the terms of that deal, the so-called PPA deal may take a long time to develop because that means uh, that th th those are the terms under which money is made and power is allocated. It's a serious bit of business. And until that's been done five, six, seven, eight, hundred, hundred, two hundred times, it's not really in a pattern. So Hawaiian Electric struggles, the developer struggles to reach some common ground uh, because the needs of a small grid like this are different than the needs of a place that has uh, developed wind for a long time. So there's delay. What happens when there's delay? So, uh, you know, tax, tax credits step down, and that's the end of the economics of the project. Never mind all the other stuff we're talking about. So we just have to keep trying and trying and trying and trying and getting some kind of general consensus about what the proper balance is so that we can move ahead. I don't, okay. I don't intend to uh, quit. <clears throat> No, uh, but uh, uh, stay healthy because you're going to need a lot of years for that. Uh, <laughs> so I want to ask you one last question, Tony, uh, and that is this. And so all the things we've talked about, all the vectors and factors and considerations, what is the future of a project like the Eurus project, wind and why not? What is the future of that? I mean, and it's important to you because this is your land. Uh, what what is going to happen here? And build it all in. Tell me what your 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 projection is. Well, first of all, it's not in Waianae and it's not in Nanakuli. It's in an area in between Nanakuli and uh, uh, roughly, you know, rid ridges above Kapolei. Um, well, I wish I could tell you exactly what the future holds. I can tell you what the future does not hold. It does not hold uh, what we had hoped for, which was to use the revenue from uh, a wind or alternative energy project as the keystone to ecosystem restoration. That's what we are about mainly. I would like to be a contributor in the alternative energy scenario, but I also want to do ecosystem restoration. You've got land there that bleeds away because it's been over ranched for 150 years. Topsoil's gone, forest needs to be replaced, fire needs to be suppressed. If we did that, we could regrow something like a native forest. We could put water back into the ground. Possibly the folks on either side of the ridge would have their springs recover and they could do something useful with the water. Um, not going to happen anytime soon because I'm, you know, I don't have a big enough uh, checkbook. But if we could get a keystone project, we could achieve many of these valuable sustainability goals, including soil restoration projects would possibly uh, find a way to help the busted ag two land uh, recover some productivity, which we will need. Um, the, the, the way okay, forward well, isn't, isn't clear. I can tell you the things yeah, that will well, not no, happen. There's so many 
uncertainties in our in our world, much less our state right now. Uh, we seem to be one crisis, one trouble to another. But let me ask you this, though. Um, let's assume that everybody, 1.4 million people are watching this program, hopefully soon. Oh, God, God. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what what message would you leave with them? What, what would you urge and advocate for them to do and think in order to deal with um, you know, the various factors that led to the withdrawal of Europe's energy and the factors we've discussed here in this discussion? This will sound a little tongue in cheek, but I have no other way of coping. Okay. I'd say, let's look at the use of language. Um, the first use of language and the most common is gossip. That's what people do mostly. The second use, the second most common is spreading all kinds of nonsense mythology. And only after you've exhausted your interest in those, do you get to the use of language as a means of communicating facts and plans and data that matter for common survival. And that's the realm of science. People are going to have to turn the temperature down, get rid of the first two, keep everybody out of the room who can't get rid of the first two uses of language and start talking very seriously about planning forward. And it's going to take a lot of minds and a lot of time at the rate we go. But first and foremost, I think that people have to start talking again about building a society. Uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a Democrat by birth, as you know, and then one of the things that we used to talk about quite a lot was, was building a common society that worked for everyone. We have lost the ability to articulate that. I know that uh, various governors and politicians have tried to, but we've lost the ability to say, how we are all in it together and how we need to set aside the schismatic elements of race, ethnicity, background, and culture. And if we don't do that, I think the future is very predictable. The standard of living will drop, opportunities will drop. We will not solve the energy problem. We will not solve the resources problem. And we're going to be in one big hurt. And it's only to the extent that we can see our common interest above all the schismatic elements and get calm people in a room to slice out what the proper balance is that we're going to survive. It, it is a question of survival. Uh, it is not a light matter. The coronavirus is a drop in the bucket, folks. The big bulldozer of the future is bearing down on you and you have got to pay attention. There's, there's nobody with any credibility who thinks that this is going to be an easy solve. We're going to have to do things that have not been thought of before with tech that doesn't currently exist. Either that or two thirds of the people on the earth can just vacate. It's a simple, simple problem with a bulldozer bearing down on us from the future. And until we take that seriously, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, I, I don't have any claim to omniscience, but I can see the problem. Well, thank you, Tony. Tony Gill, landowner, part of the uh, Everlands, the Gill Everlands Trust, I guess, and um, mentalist at the same time. Thank you so much, Tony. It's really wonderful to hear your thoughts on this. Aloha well, and, Jay, and uh, stay well. Uh, you too. Um,